Hello and welcome to We On Live broadcast from London. I'm Oliver Regan and these are the headlines. The UK economy to fare worse than any other developed country, including Russia, in fiscal year 2023, says the IMF. Britain's economy is forecast to shrink 0.6% in 2223. More trouble for Rishi Sunak. Global IT major Infosys, co-founded by Sunak's father-in-law, is in dispute with the UK's Revenue and Customs Department over a £20 million corporation tax bill. Ninety-three people dead in suicide bombing in Pakistan's Peshawar. Dozens of police personnel among those killed the Tariq El Taliban Pakistan says it's not responsible for the blast. India forecasts that its economy will grow between 6 and 6.8% in the next financial year, down from 7% projected for the current year. Finance Minister to present the union budget tomorrow. Britain's four-time Olympic champion Mo Farah has signalled that 2023 will be the final year of his athletics career after confirming he will give the London Marathon one more shot in April. All's not well with Britain's economy. The International Monetary Fund says the UK's economy would fare worse than any other developed country in the last year. It actually forecasts a negative growth of 0.6% for the UK. Russia too is predicted to record positive growth. The IMF's revised numbers predict minus 0.6 growth for the UK this year and 0.9% growth in 2024. Britain's the only developed world economy forecast to slide into recession this year. The IMF predicted that UK household spending would falter under the weight of high energy prices, rising mortgage costs and increased taxes. Russia is predicted growth at 0.3%. Revised forecasts for Germany and Italy put them in the green too. The IMF's revised projections put pressure on British Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt to come up with a growth plan. Well, for more on this, we're joined by Hilary Ingham, UK economist, uh, economist at Lancaster University, joining us live from Lytham. Um, Hilary, many thanks for joining us. These are pretty stark numbers for the UK economy. And of course, many people will be asking, why is it so bad in the UK compared with the news elsewhere? Yes, it is rather depressing that, uh, you know, we've got such a gloomy growth forecast and I think, you know, as you said in your report, the fact that we're even going to be outperformed by Russia will be quite a shock to some people. I mean, we've got the same sort of problems as other countries have got, but we seem to be suffering from them worse. So our inflation rate is, you know, among the worst in Europe. And the government is obviously committed to tackling this. And Jeremy Hunt has said until inflation is under control, he's not looking to sort of, you know, give us tax breaks. And so we've had a series of quite steep interest rate increases. It looks like we're going to get another one this Thursday. And of course, these interest rate increases are affecting mortgage rates. And that is really stifling the housing market. You know, the cost of living crisis is very severe in this country. We've got rising energy prices like everywhere else. But we've got incredible food inflation. You know, some prices are going up by, say, 30 percent. So we, we really are suffering 
quite severely. And of course, we've got the overhang, some of which is due to Brexit, that we've got labour shortages. So in some cases, our employers are having to offer quite big wage increases if they want to fill vacancies. And as I'm sure is widely reported, you know, we've got a sort of raft of strikes throughout the public sector. So at the minute, the UK economy really isn't looking into healthier state. And it looks like this is going to continue uh, for the rest of the year. And of course, that puts pressure on the UK politicians, Rishi Sunak, Jeremy Hunt. Is there anything that they can do to to change things and to improve the economic outlook? I think they're in a, a very difficult situation because on the one hand, you know, there are people in the Conservative Party, actually quite a lot of MPs who would like to push for tax cuts, you know, maybe not with the sort of generosity that Liz Truss was going to afford everybody, but they would like tax cuts. You know, Conservatives are a low tax party. But at the same time, you know, Jeremy Hunt has said he's committed to stabilising the economy and getting this inflation rate down. And although we know that it is falling, you know, it's still over 10 percent. So it is way, way above target. So I think in the short term, that is going to be what they are focusing on. I don't see any big giveaways for either consumers or firms until that inflation rate comes more under control. Hilary Ingham, economist at Lancaster University, many thanks for your insight. Thank you. Bye. As the threat of the cost of living crisis and high food inflation still looms over the UK, the state-run health service, the NHS, has come up with some stark numbers reflecting the state of the National Health Service. Latest figures say hospitals in England cancelled 88,000 appointments over the last year. Appointments for more than 10,000 people who booked a meeting for an operation were also postponed. 56,000 56, outpatient appointments to see a consultant were also rearranged. According to NHS providers, the number of postponed appointments will soon soar. Meanwhile, the UK is also set to witness the biggest teacher strike in recent times. The action is going to affect 23,000 schools in England and Wales. This comes after the talks between the union and the government failed. According to the union chief, the UK government had been unwilling to seriously engage with the causes of strike action. The strike is going to have a significant impact on more than 4 million students in England and Wales. Firefighters across the UK have also voted for strike action in a dispute over pay. According to the Fire Brigades Union, while it has a mandate to take its members out on strike, it's not looking forward to announcing any dates until it meets the employers. Last month, more than 80% of members who voted backed strike action across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. There's also another dimension with public sympathy stepping in. As the UK endures a cost of living crisis, public libraries and other community hubs are providing warm spaces for vulnerable members of society in order to stay safe and access free food this winter. It's a great warm space to come to because uh, obviously cost of heating these days, uh, my house has been cold and this is always open seven days a week and uh, they always offer you t time and experience. I found that it offers lots and lots of other services as well. Um, I go to a men's group on a, on a Monday, which is, which is great. And uh, there's lots of different things that come into the library. We have a food bank, which I use quite a lot. Um, I went through an experience of the uh, cost of living crisis, of not being able to afford food. And uh... Well, for more on this, we're joined by our correspondent, Alex Isaac in London. Alex, the news of firefighters adding to the list of striking people is, is obviously a, a big sign that this is escalating in an even worse direction now. Well, uh, sadly, there seems to be a lot more joining the strike action because it's all about pay and as the government has been a stalwart on that fact. We're going to see more joining BMA members as junior doctors and senior doctors will have 
the results of their ballots by the end of February. And it's likely that they will also strike. Obviously, we have this big strike coming tomorrow where we'll see um, teachers, university lecturers, train drivers, civil servants, bus drivers all on strike tomorrow. So it is going to be a real pressure on the rest of the UK trying to get around, get to work, get to those who need care. And then we're looking ahead to next week. We're also going to see the NHS workers, ambulance workers on strikes. This does seem to be quite never ending. And it, it, it is because the government has said over and over again that there is no money to be paying out for all of these this cost until inflation comes down and of course when does that's going to happen we're not quite sure yet and we have quite a bleak look ahead on the horizon there doesn't seem to be any change to our economic status anytime soon so more and more public service sectors will go on strike of course we did hear about the anti-strike bill yesterday it has now gone through the house of commons despite having many complaints from the opposition party as well as from some of the conservative members who say that it shouldn't be allowed to go ahead in a state that it is so now it is going through the house of lords it still needs to go through um, to go through a number of sections there before it becomes a bill so that looks like it is actually getting fast tracked that means that if this goes through that all of these public sectors will have to put a minimum level of service so that people are still getting the service they need but as we've heard today there are already surgeries at the nhs that has being cancelled, elective surgeries as well. And that still is a huge backlash from what we saw in COVID. And Rishi Sunak said in his New Year's speech that this is one of the five priorities that he wanted to change. He wanted to cut out the waiting list for the NHS. And it looks like it's getting worse from COVID during the strikes and going forward as well. And whether or not people are coming to libraries to, to get the warmth is not quite a, as good look as it does seem. Some libraries are having to, I'm here in South East London, a number of libraries are shutting in the morning and are, are looking to sell their buildings as well because they just can't afford the upkeep. The council has to put the money into other areas and, and care and mental health is not their top priority. And it's not about keeping people warm in the libraries. It's a bit of a sad state of affairs for the general public, really, as they're seeing strikes, they're seeing their bills going up, and they're not seeing much support from the government. Alex Isaac joining us live from London there. Many thanks. The impact of cost of living crisis and high inflation is not just limited to the sectors on strike. Many small businesses in the UK are being hammered by rising costs. And now it seems it's also hit the UK's favourite beverage business. In eastern England, a brewery named Milton Brewery is jammed full of pallets stacked high with sacks of malt, which is a key ingredient for a traditional cask beer. Earlier, the owner used to order the grain when it was required, but now he's stockpiling it, buying three to four months of supply in advance to try and stave off the impact of soaring prices. We are dealing with the greatest uh, level of price increases that we've ever seen. We've been going 23 years um, and things are going through the roof. We can't pass on all the, the price rises and certainly not immediately. Um, it's a very volatile set of price rises that we are faced with. Sometimes, for example, CO2 was up 600% earlier um, in the last six months ago. and and. Being able to predict these things is as difficult to work with as the price rises themselves. Inflation is hovering at over 10%, close to 40-year highs. According to official figures, the prices of food and non-alcoholic drinks is 16.8% higher in December than a year before. Gas and electricity prices are up by 130% and 65% respectively in the year to December. And this has left many small businesses fighting for survival. They're not big enough to negotiate better rates from suppliers and constantly face resistance to price hikes from buyers. The food prices when we're in the supermarkets, how much they've gone up, um, and that has kind of impacted a bit on the decisions on what we buy. We maybe buy slightly um, cheaper um, um, items in the supermarket than we would normally do just because of the, the cost of the everyday items, you know, bread, eggs, things like that. They've all gone up. India forecasts GDP growth to slow 
in the next fiscal year. Amid a bleak world economic outlook and a surge in global demand for the country's exports. The government's annual economic survey, tabled by the finance minister on Tuesday, is a report card for the centre to review how the economy has fared in the past year. And it also becomes the basis for the government to plan and allocate funds in its budget, which will be unveiled on Wednesday. The latest economic survey shows India projected to grow at 6 to 6.8% in the next fiscal year starting in April, down from the expected 7% for the current year. Under the baseline scenario, India's growth rate is pegged at 6.5%, which will be the lowest in three years. The survey further shows that India is expected to remain strong in relative to other global economies on robust domestic demand, a pickup in bank lending and improved spending by private companies. That suggests India is likely to be the fastest growing major economy. A slowing global economy will likely hurt India's exports even as strong domestic demand keeps imports higher. That, in addition to a weaker rupee, will widen the trade gap and is likely to challenge the Modi government on how it manages the country's finances. India's projected higher inflation, driven by the Russia-Ukraine war, has um, has created distortions, but the survey showed the rise in price pressures has already peaked. The UK marks three years of Brexit today, the country's exit from the European Union. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak defended it, adding that leaving the EU has brought significant achievements and huge opportunity for the UK. Sunex said the UK forged a path as an independent nation and that momentum has not slowed. He specifically mentioned the UK's vaccine rollout, trade deals with 70 countries and taking back control of the UK's borders. Sunak made these remarks as he himself marks 100 days in 10 Downing Street. This comes as Sunak faces numerous challenges. He did not, however, mention challenges in Northern Ireland surrounding post-Brexit trading agreements. 63% of respondents in a YouGov poll say the Conservative government is handling the issue of Brexit badly. Have you heard about immersive art? It's a trend that uses new media to create a total body experience. It pulls you into the world of the artists and their art, urging you to lose your sense of self in the process. Masterpieces by some of the most beloved artists of all time have been transformed into 360 degree immersive shows. Weon's entertainment editor, Abira Dar, visited one such show in Mumbai, based on Vincent van Gogh. Here's a special report. After traveling various cities around the world, the Van Gogh 360 degree immersive show has made its debut in India and we are here to experience it. With buzzing shows across North America, Europe, Asia and the Middle East, this 360 degree immersive art experience has been hailed as a one of its kind exhibit. But what makes it so special? One major reason is the relevance to people today. Uh, Van Gogh has gone through a major depression and mental health issues that he uh, that today, like never before, we have the number of people who are going through this issue. So our audiences, our, our guests who are coming out here, they can relate to his story. Um, secondly, it's about definitely the art that he's brought to life. And the, the brush strokes, the colors, uh, art enthusiasts do appreciate that a lot. The immersive experience is divided into two zones. Before witnessing his art, you walk through the educational section, which takes you back in time to Van Gogh's early life when he started discovering his passion for arts. As well as his childhood trauma, which is believed to have initiated his lifelong suicidal ideation. It is said that great art comes from great pain. Perhaps Van Gogh's ethereal painting, The Starry Night, remains the greatest evidence of this idea. 
the Dutch artist painted the masterpiece during his 12 month stay in a mental asylum. This immersive art experience will be traveling to three different cities in India Mumbai, Delhi, and Bangalore. Here are a few things the organizers would like you to keep in mind before making a visit. People should remember that in an art event, there are uh, people who want to appreciate art. Uh, unlike any other event, uh, this event needs to be uh, immersed into. That's why we call it as immersive experience. So sit down, relax, lie down the way you would like to go ahead and experience the event, but do not be, uh, do not uh, encourage your kids to run around, uh, do not keep your mobile phone on loud, just keep it on silent, do not talk loud in while you are in the immersive room because apart from you, there are other guests also who would like to go ahead and dwell into this experience. You don't have to be a Van Gogh fan to experience this 360 degree immersive show. It's a great way to get introduced to his art and the heartbreaking stories behind it. With video journalist Ashok Sonavni, this is Abhiradhar signing off from Mumbai for Vion. World is one. Looks fascinating. Well, that's all from your We On live broadcast from London. I've been Oliver Regan. Many thanks for joining us.